Good morning, Lifeline Church. Who is excited to be in the house of God today? Come on, let's hear it. Amen. Amen. So good to see you today. What a beautiful day it is. It's always beautiful when I get to be here with you. Oh, isn't that sweet? My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Come on, one more time. Give it up for yourselves. You're amazing. You know, you get cursed at enough just going to work and driving down the street. I believe you ought to just come to church and hear a blessing and some encouragement right out of the gate there. We have a mission here at the church. You can say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline by leading people into becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. Today is a special day because growth track is after second service today. It's actually the fast track. So if you know anybody, if you know anybody who needs to be on the team, maybe you, you've been on the You've been in the stands, so to speak. You've been kind of watching the game go on, but you're ready to get out of the stands and and into the game and join the dream team. Then Growth Track is for you. It's happening directly after second service. You are invited to be our guest for that and invite someone to come with you. Uh, Life is better together. Amen, somebody? It's a good thing. So um, a couple little things before we get going. Um, We have an excellent opportunity to reach our community this year through our fireworks booth. There's a lot of reasons to cheer around here. I'm like, this is the fifth time I've asked you to applause. I'm not going to do it this time. I'm not going to do it. We have a fireworks booth outreach, and that's the way we're looking at it. This is our chance to be an outreach to the community, to meet people that we wouldn't normally get to meet in our city. They're just going to come and buy fireworks from us, but we're here to show you that this church family is for you, is for you. If you're outside of the church, if you're far from God, if you feel far from God, if you haven't been involved with the church for a long time, we want to be there for you. And that's the heart I want to come into this fireworks booth with, is I want to go there, but I also want to bring some invite cards there to introduce this series that we're starting in two weeks called At The Movies. And I got a special treat for you. I got a little intro video. It's not happening yet, but I just had to show you this video. It's really fun. So come on, let's play that video. Let's get something going on, get some excitement going. Let's see. Lifeline Church, welcome to At The Movies. This is one of the most exciting series we do all year long. And this is a series where we use modern day parables to communicate biblical truths. I'm so excited because this is a great opportunity for you to invite your friends and family I promise you they've never seen anything like this before. So here's what I want you to do today. I want you to allow these movies and these parables to let you see the gospels, to see God's truth, like a pair of 3D glasses getting put on for you to be able to see God's truths in a brand new way. I believe he'll transform your heart and transform your understanding about the word of God. So from all of us here, Welcome to Lifeline, and welcome to At The Movies. Yeah, that's right, it's coming. That's right, it's coming. Now that's what is the, that's the video and the website that they'll go to if people scan the little QR code that are on the movie ticket invites on your seat. Probably sat on them. There's some extras outside in the entryway for you to hand out. But we're going to be handing those tickets out to everybody at the fireworks booth. I would love for you to take them to work with you, uh, take them to school with you, take them where you go, take them to the park, wherever, you're at the, kid, at the park with the kids, hand them out to people. And if they scan that QR code, you can let people know this, if they scan that QR code, they're going to go to a special website that has that video on it, plus a breakdown of what it is. And, and of course, what it is, is we're taking movies and we're breaking them down using clips from those movies and inserting biblical truths in between. It's really, it's hard to explain, but once you've seen it, you know it's a lot of fun. And so that is going to start July 9th. Everyone say July 9th. It's a big day. We're starting with Star Wars, so it's hard to beat that. And then the week after might be my favorite, Inside Out. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm so pumped up. It's going to be so much fun. So invite somebody, and I'm, re- I'm really, really excited. So now is a great time to go ahead and take out your message notes. If you've got a bulletin coming in, there's some notes in there. You can take some notes with us, or you can get the Version Bible app and download that and find our church in the events tab, and you can take some notes that way. We are in part two of a three-part series called Simply Trinity. And what we wanted to do in this series is explain how God has a triune nature. 
God has a triune nature. Even though the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, it is a word that we came up with later just to describe what the Bible talks about from Genesis to Revelation, that that we were created in his image. Let us make man in our image. There's plural. There was a plural statement there. He was, he wasn't talking to angels. He wasn't talking to anybody else, but there is a Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I wanted to take just a few weeks to help us understand the doctrine of the Trinity, because I, th- I believe it's really going to equip us to walk our faith out in a new way, knowing that there is a difference, but there is the same entity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 16, Jesus said this, I will ask the Father. So here's Jesus saying, I'm going to ask somebody else, the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Of course, he's speaking about the Holy Spirit, but that word, the Greek word for another, Alan, it's not pronounced Alan. I just do the best I can with these Greek words, man. Every week I say that, I know, but I just have to clarify, I don't speak Greek super well. But Alan, and that's just the way I'm gonna say it, Alan, it means another of the same kind. Another, not of a different kind, not a different God, not a separate God, but another but of the same kind. And so that's what we're gonna walk through today is what that means. Uh, And someone made this for me last week. Um, I was was talking about this doctrine of the Trinity and someone sent me a meme um, right uh, right after I was got done preaching to help explain what it is. This is kind of what it looks like. You got three Spider-Mans. They're all the same, but they're kind of different and they're all pointing to each other. And that's what it looks like. Jesus is always pointing us to the Father. The Holy Spirit's always pointing us back to Jesus. And the Father's always saying, look at my son. Here he is, I'm well pleased. It's, it's complicated, but it's really not. It's complicated, but it's really not. But what I want for you is to understand how we relate to each individual in the, in the Godhead because it'll equip us in our faith. It'll equip us in our faith. Jesus is the son, of course. And um, if you did not know that, I am so glad you're in church today because I'm gonna just be disclosing so many new fun things for you. But the son is referring to Jesus. The son is referring to Jesus. The son uh, pretty much stole the show. And if anybody wants to single out anybody, it's Jesus why? Because of the miracles, because of the teaching, uh, because of the, all the healings he was doing. He was the man, <laughs> but he was also God. <laughs> he was the man, but he was also God, the God man, the man who was God. It sounds complicated, but it's really not. Let's dig in. Let's just go for it right now. Let's talk about understanding the sun. The first little section in your notes is we're going to talk about understanding the sun. There are many ways to describe Jesus, many ways. But the first description that the gospel writer John used to describe Jesus was, Jesus is the word. You can write that in your notes, commit this to memory somehow, but Jesus is the word. And the word, word, in the word, is logos. Logos. Um, it's the word that means, that, that Greek word means the content about which is being spoken about. So you're talking about something, the idea, the concept, the what you're referring to, that's the logos. That's, that's the entity of it. So that's what John said right here in John 1, uh, verses 1 and 2 and 14 is where I'm going to read. In the beginning was the word, the logos, the idea, the content. And the word was with God and the word was God. He, he was God. He's with God in the beginning. And then verse 14 says, the word became flesh. Who's that talking about? It's talking about Jesus. The word, the content, the logos became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. There it is. That's why we refer to him as the son right there who came from the father, full of grace and full of truth. Now those two words, I could preach a whole series on those two words, but I got to stay focused. I got to stay focused. I've had just enough coffee so I can stay focused, but I still have a lot of energy. (laughs) But stay focused today. First thing about Jesus is that he is God. He is absolutely God. The physical manifestation of all the ideas, um, all the thoughts, all the being that is God. Now, uh, to help us understand this is every other God that in that time and even before then in the Old Testament, all these other little G gods, they all needed an idol. Maybe you've heard of this. Like, 
uh, there's idols and you make a little statue and you bow down, you pray to it, you make it out of wood, you make it out of stone, whatever. All these other little gods had, had idols, a statue, something, something made in the image of the God that you were supposed to be worshiping. Um, actually, in the book of Isaiah, it's very funny. Um, Isaiah was making fun of all these religions and all of these gods that needed to have something created after them because Jesus, who we knew was coming in the Old Testament, he was the physical representation. And it's actually the second commandment. You will make no idols. Not for me. You're not going to make no statues of me. You're not, God was speaking to his people. Don't make any statues of me. Don't, don't erect any or anything like that because I'm going to send my son and he's going to be the physical representation of me. And Isaiah makes fun of all these other little G-gods. He says, you go out to the woods, you cut down a tree, you build yourself a chair, you put some firewood in your fire, and then with the remaining wood, you, you make a little god and worship it. Like, what are you thinking? Like, obviously that god means nothing. Obviously that god is ridiculous. And, and God, the real god, the one true god said, you're not going to do that. Why? Because I'm going to send my son, and nothing is going to take his place. Nothing is going to represent me other than him. And then afterwards, I'm going to let my spirit dwell in all the people. Ooh, but I got to stay focused. That's next week. That's next week. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit next week. Jesus is the Logos Word of God containing all the content of God in physical form. Tracking with me so far? Very good. Let's move on to the next thing. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. The Son of God is the way and the truth and the life. Some of you may have heard that before, but let's break that down. Let's talk about that. John 14, verse 6 says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. There is no other way of life other than the one Jesus represents. There is no other truth outside of the truth that Jesus taught us. And there is no life to be found other than the life that Jesus has to offer. That's a great place to say amen, church. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No one comes to the Father or gets to heaven, so to speak, except through him. You can't get to heaven by being a good person. You can't get to heaven by just checking some boxes. No, we need to come through Jesus. We need to accept Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. That's, that's Jesus' role. That's Jesus' role. Before he hit the scene, you, we had to do sacrifices. And I say we, none of us were there. But in the Old Testament, you had to sacrifice a lamb. You had to sacrifice a bull. You had to go to this purification ceremony. And there was a lot to it. Jesus the Son satisfied all of it, all of it. So he is now the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way. But you know, sometimes in life, sometimes there's more than one way to get somewhere. Um, very recently, um, I found this out kind of the ridiculous way, that there's more than one way to get to L.A. I, I've never heard of any other way other than going over the grapevine. Has anyone else gone to L.A. from here other than the grapevine? Show of hands, there's like two of you. It must have been terrible. It must have been terrible. I, I recently met up with my parents in LA and my dad, what can I say about my dad? He probably watched it online. My dad is a strong, confident man of God. Okay, now that that's out of the way. He also likes stress-free driving and he's a little bit old school. He likes... find real satisfaction in life. I should know. I've tried every other way. I've been there. I've done that. I've tried. I've tried all the other ways. And just take my word for it. If you have not done that, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. 
He is the best way. He is the best way. And so don't do that. He is the way uh, through Jesus. It's like space. The only way to get there is through Elon Musk. Because he ain't ready either. <laughs> there seems to be no way to get there right now anyways over that. The last thing I want to tell you, understanding Jesus, understanding Jesus is Jesus has absolute authority. Jesus has absolute authority. Now, this is where I want to bring something to you that you may not have a great, you know, this, this doesn't get taught about very often, the difference between power and authority. Um, so let me break this word down to you, authority. Jesus is absolute authority. This word means jurisdiction, permission, rulership, control. You've heard of the word authority before, and it's found right here in Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority, all authority. Say authority. 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 It's different than power, man. It's different. It's different. It has a unique role and a unique function. I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. There's a pretty big difference there, and that's why coming next week to hear about Tiffany preaching on the Holy Spirit is going to be so important because the Holy Spirit is the one who is said to have the power. Do not leave Jerusalem. The power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses. Jesus said himself, don't even leave Jerusalem until the power of the Holy Spirit is on you because I, I, even though I have the authority, it's the Holy Spirit that has the power. I'm going to show this to you and because some of you might not even be tracking with this right now. I, I thought Jesus was, was it. Jesus just walked around doing everything. But, but listen, Jesus was a, a man, a man. Um, he emptied himself of his godhood. And I'm going to explain this to you. But just the, this, that's why it's so important to understand the doctrine of the Trinity, to understand how God works and understanding that there is a Holy Spirit, there is a Son, and there is a Father, and they operate in, in different functions. Uh, so the best way I, I know to describe the difference between power and authority is a tank has power. A tank has power to crush a house. But the commanding officer has the authority to tell that tank where to go. In the Bible, watch this. In the Bible, no miracles took place until after Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. Has anyone ever noticed that? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But also there's, there's like fiction. There's little books that are written. There's movies put out that aren't the Bible, but they show, I've, I've looked into it, I've seen them, they're out there, but it's, it's not true, of young Jesus. Like the kids are all skipping water and then he's like, hey, like walking on the water. It's like he played around and, you know, you know his mom is like telling him, Mary's telling him, clean your room. And he's like, and it is all clean. You know, it's very cute. It's very funny. But there's a reason it's not in the Bible. There are no miracles recorded about Jesus until after he was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Why is that? I believe is because God was showing us what the function of the difference between power and authority and us having the Holy Spirit and showing us that we as human beings can be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and walk around Jesus said himself, greater miracles will you do. Even greater works will you do through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a big deal because if we only think it's just Jesus, he died, went to heaven. So we're, we're just left just trying to live good lives, trying to keep our nose clean. No, we actually have lives that have power associated with them. I'll show you in Philippians 2. I'll, I'll show it to you right here. Philippians 2 um, verses 6 and 7 says this, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up. And in other translation, it says he emptied himself of his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. Jesus was a sinless human. Of course, he was untethered by a sin nature. That's one major difference. That's why you and me, we can't die for people's sins. He could because he was a spotless lamb. And I'm sure it helped him in his communion with the Holy Spirit, which we will have to deal with. But he was walking around with that power. He was, he was a human being walking around with the power of the Holy Spirit, just like you and I are encouraged to do in the whole New Testament. We're taught about this. And he was well acquainted with that authority of that power. 
So don't miss next week. I'm encouraging you. Next week, Tiffany's going to do such a good job of, of showing us how we can be spirit-filled believers. It's not weird, but it is powerful, man. And that's the difference between just showing up to church and trying to live a good life and just trying to do the right thing day after day and actually having power associated with the Christian walk, which is what we were always intended to have, that we were supposed to be able to help people when they needed it that we would lay our hands on the sick, that they would recover, that our prayers would actually do things. That's the power that comes from the Holy Spirit, and understanding it is, is part of wielding that power, understanding the authority that comes from Jesus. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about how we can walk with Jesus in this authority. The, the last section in your notes, if you're taking notes, is, is walking with Jesus. So he's God in the flesh. He's the way to heaven. He has all authority. What should we do with that? What should we do with all this information? Number one, we should follow him. Follow him. And before you think, oh yeah, I heard that, done that, doing that, let's talk more about this. Following him, and I think preachers and pastors do a, a disservice sometimes not explaining what that means because there's new people in church all the time, right? And if you just say, follow Jesus, if I'm new to church, I'd be thinking, do you see him? Like, did he just go in the sound booth? I don't see, do you have like some glasses? How am I supposed to follow him? What we mean by that is we're supposed to follow his lead. We're supposed to follow the lead and the example and, and what Jesus laid out, the way of life he laid out. We're supposed to follow that. We're supposed to follow that. So watch the way. see me when no one else can. Not like I have some special ability that you guys don't have as a pastor. That's not true. Anyone, listen to that. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Does anybody want to grow in wisdom? Does anybody at Lifeline Church want to grow in their wisdom and, and be able to have wisdom to walk into different situations and, and see breakthrough and see miracles in your workplace, in your family? If you want to have wisdom, anyone, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds his house on solid rock, though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. All, the, all your Bible, your Bible, the, the 66 books in the Old Testament, New Testament, reading that thing every single day. You know, this is supposed to help you in your life. It's supposed to give you tools so that when the storms of life come, when challenges come, when life gets stressful, when it hits the fan and things get tough, your house will stand. Your house will stand. This is not a, this is not a sacrifice or, a, or this is not something that you're just supposed to suffer through it. No, your house will stand. You will survive because anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a man who builds his house on a rock. When the rains come, when trouble comes, when life gets hard, when you have no idea what to do, your house will stand. Amen. Good news about this is following Jesus, following his teaching takes zero creativity. <laughs> zero creativity, which is good for me. I mean, I know how to play instruments, and I know, I'm kind of like an artist in that sense, but I'm I'm not all that creative. Like all the songs I ever wrote, I got a little CD put out and I, um, I, I recorded all that stuff myself. It's all original stuff. But all the songs I know sound like other songs. All right, I'm just not that creative. I got, I'm outing myself right now. I'm not that creative and I just can't help it, which is a good thing for me. It's all written down for me. It's all written down for me. I just get to read the word of God and follow what it says. And I don't have to wonder, huh, what should I do in my, my purity life? Hmm, what should I do with substances? Oh, what should I do with, with this, that, the other thing? If I look to the word of God and try and find it there, it's gonna be there for me. And if it's not written about, then guess what? I'm gonna have people in my life that help me find out that it actually is written about because that's important too. Is you can have your word, but you also need good, healthy people in your life to help shape that. We need to follow his way and follow his example. Uh, most of the time when people struggle uh, following God, it's because they don't like, excuse me, I'm so sorry. They don't like what they already know they should be doing. 
That's the, usually, and I'm speaking as a, as a pastor, as experience, a lot of times people come to me and they're, oh, I'm not sure what I should do. You know, I've got this, this boyfriend or girlfriend and, I, and I'm thinking about what I should do here. I'm like, I think you do know. <laughs> I think you kind of have a gut feeling if you've been in church any length of time. I, you probably have an idea of what you should do or not do. But a lot of times, I'm not saying every time, but a lot of times when we struggle with not just that area, any area in life, we struggle f- like following what, what God has us do. It's because we're what we know is true in the word of God or we legitimately don't know. Let's not excuse that. I mean, we, our, our culture today, our kids these days, you know, are, they're, they're growing up without, you know, Bibles being taught. And that's just normal. For, I mean, I'm, I'm 30, how old am I? 37 years old. <laughs> and so when I grew up in school, there was no, there was no scripture readings. There was nothing like that. There hasn't been anything like that for generations. But I'll tell you this, um, things have changed over the time and kids are growing up with less and less Bible, less and less word. Oh, is this, you want me to use this? Oh, cool. Thanks. <laughs> Was this not working the whole time? Wow, that's crazy. I'm just going to take that off then. I'm going to turn this off then. I'm not shaking at all. This is great. This is great. So kids these days, <laughs> kids these days are growing up less and less Bible literate is what I'm, is what I'm trying to say. And so it's, it's more understandable to, to think that people wouldn't know, that they wouldn't understand, that they that they wouldn't know what the Bible has to say about these key issues, about sexuality, about purity, about money. Hello, let's talk about how to handle our money. But the Bible has so much to say about that. And, and because we're, we're not in there, it's, we're not in the Bible, it's, it's harder and harder for people to, to, to understand what God wants us to do. And so if you don't, legit don't know, I would just encourage you, get in the word of God as much as you can. Get into some of our life groups when they start up again in the fall because there are so many people in this church that love reading the word of God, love to encourage one another. It's a really encouraging place. I would have to just, I'm just gonna brag on you guys for just a minute. This last life group season was so wonderful to see so many people getting involved in that. We had, at one time, we had more people signed up in life groups and coming to life groups than were actually even coming on Sunday mornings. We were going beyond our Sunday attendance in our in our life groups, which is beautiful to me. And it's so encouraging because that's where we really get to know those heart issues in the word of God and, and people can encourage us in it. You can encourage, you can get encouraged in that. So it reminds me again, in LA, I was visiting Disneyland when my dad was trying to visit us in LA. And it reminds me of Disneyland. The first time I went to Disneyland as an adult, I went with my good friends, um, Jason and Heather. Jason and Heather are um, season pass holders, right? And they must go to Disneyland, I don't know, 20 times a year. You know, they got no kids. They're, you know, two incomes, uh, no kids. What do you call that? You call it something. There's a name for it. Don't worry about it. It's cool. So they're just going to Disneyland all the time. They know the place inside and out. And this was before Genie Plus, so they knew about the fast path. And when we went there, it was the first time I went as an adult, and I just followed them. And I was so grateful. Because they knew exactly where to go. As soon as the park opened, we were like, come on, we're going to Indiana Jones. I'm like, all right, we're going to Indiana Jones. And we went there and we hit the fat, but we're not going to ride it? No, you just hit the button and then you go somewhere else. I'm like, okay. And so we were just going all over the place. I had no idea where I was going, but it was really fun. And we got all the best food. We got to ride all the best rides. Why? Because I was following someone who was further along than me. They were well acquainted, this is like, and when they get out of sight, when Jesus gets out of sight in my life, I'm like, Jesus! And I was thinking like when, when Heather and Jason would get a little bit out of sight, Jason! <laughs> oh no, don't leave me! It's like they would, you get separated. If you've been to Disneyland, you know, you know. It's very, very scary if you get separated from your people. You know, they knew everything. And I was on them like white on rice. I wasn't letting them out of my sight. If you've had a new job, you know what this feels like. If you have a new job and you're a little uncomfortable there, there's always that one person you work with and you're like following them everywhere they go. You're going here, you go there. I know none of you party anymore. Well, but if you've ever been to a party, I've been to a couple parties in my day and there's like the one person you know, you show up with them and you don't know anybody else there and everywhere they go, you're like, <laughs> 
<laughs> what are you doing? You're going to have some punch? I'll get some too. <laughs> oh, you're going to go out back? I guess I will too. <laughs> you're just following them everywhere, right? Because there's a, there's a comfort and there's a safety in knowing that there's someone there who is further along than me and knows where to go, knows what to do, and knows how we can walk this out. This thing is dripping off of me. Tiff, I'm going to give this to you. You want this? Here. Oh, now I can preach. Oh, yeah. Now I'm, oh, now I'm free. <laughs> That's what following Jesus is like. We're, we're following his lead. We're following his example. And it's good to have people in our lives that are following him that are further along than us, too. That's what it means to follow him. Number two, we need to be like him. We need to be like him. So walking with Jesus, not just following his lead, not just following his example, but being like him, too. It's, it's a separate issue. It's a separate issue. We don't just want to go where he tells us to go and do what he tells us to do, we wanna do it with the same attitude that he had. That's a big deal. Remember Philippians 2, I'm gonna go back to that. Philippians 2, but this time verse five, it says you must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Remember that bracelet, that old bracelet, what would Jesus do? I'm gonna I'm get a new one. How would Jesus do it? How would Jesus do it? Because I, I picture this um, you know, instance, I'm thinking like, Mary Magdalene or, you know, the blind beggar or like any of the people that Jesus healed, you know, and they're like, Jesus, help me. And he's like, ugh, <laughs> idiots. All right, I guess, I guess I'll heal you, like all irritated. No, I don't think so. No, I really don't think so. There's, in fact, there's only one time in the whole Bible that I, I can recall Jesus was frustrated, irritated, make that too. One time he flipped the, the table with the money on it, and another time he got frustrated with his own disciples because they didn't have very much faith. Oh, you faithless, and I kind of like insert some tone of voice in there. But for the most part, I really feel like us at understanding the attitude that Christ had, and his attitude was humility. If there's one word, I could choose to describe his attitude. It's humility. Think about it. I was actually at the Salvation Army this last week, and in case you didn't know, I don't know why anybody would, but I go to the Salvation Army every single week, and I do Bible studies there um, in Stockton at the, at the Recovery Center, the same program I graduated many, many years ago. And I go back there, and I, I teach to the guys, and I, I teach a Bible study there. And what I do is I bring my message for Sunday. I bring it to them early, and I try it out on them. <laughs> I try it out on them. Hey, you know, sue me. What am I going to do? I'm, gonna, I'm just trying to get better for you guys, okay? I'm just trying to make it better for you. But I, I showed them this verse, and I showed them this principle. And I had one guy, he's in the drug program, okay? He's like a few months sober. But he had a really beautiful insight that I believe was from the Holy Spirit. He said to me, after the class was over, he said, you know what makes me think about Jesus' humility is the fact that he left heaven. Wow. He left heaven, and this guy, you know, he doesn't know, you know, he, does, he, he knows plenty, but, you know, he's in that situation, and he was thinking, he was just thinking out loud. His heart was just speaking, and I, I, was, I was taking it all in. He's like, I, I bet it was really nice in heaven, and that's where he was, right? I'm like, yeah, and then he left all that for us? I'm like, dude, you're right on. You are absolutely right on. That is the attitude he had. He took the humble position as a servant. And we're not just supposed to do what he does. We're not just supposed to do the things that Jesus said to do with a bunch of little kid attitude. You know, I've got, I've got kids in my house, all right? Sometimes they do what I say, but not the way I want them to do it. Only parents understand that one. It's like, clean up your room. Uh, I don't want it, man. Get off the ground. What are you doing? That is crazy. Like, what are you thinking? But, I mean, what can I say? Like, they're doing what I said to do, but they're not doing it the way I wanted them to do it. Jesus humbly gave his time and his heart to others, the Bible said. And, and where do you think a good place to do that would be, church family? Where do you think a good place to do that would be? Starting in your church. Your church would be a great place to, to be like him and have that humility and say, it's not just about me. It's not just about what I get. It's not just, oh, preach to me, pastor. Oh, yes, that's my favorite playlist, so I'm going to be happy about church when they do my songs. But when they do some other songs, I'm not going to like it. No, Jesus took the position of when I show up, it's not just for me. It's for others. That's why we... 
That's why we harp on growth track sometimes. That's why we talk about it so often, how the dream team is so important. Growth track is so important because it's one of the first ways we show people how to start living outside of themselves. And it's, it makes church not about you. Let me tell you, church gets really fun when it stops being about you. Like you can come and have your favorite playlist playing for the worship. You can come and the message was everything you needed that day. Right, But let me tell you something else. When you show up to church and you bring a friend with you, if you've ever done it, you know what I'm talking about. You're thinking about everything. I hope the playlist is good for them. I hope they are liking this. I hope the message is speaking to them because this is for them. And when we start bringing people and start coming to church, even if None of our friends are coming. I'm coming to serve. So I'm thinking, are the people walking in through the parking lot, are they feeling welcomed? Are they feeling um, embarrassed or ashamed? Because they, they, people feel that way. I don't know if you know this. People feel that way. They're, they're, if they haven't been to church in a long time, they pull up in that parking lot and they're holding on to the steering wheel. I know because I was saved as an adult and I know what it's like to come to a church for the first time. It's scary. It's scary. You wouldn't think that because... You know, if you've been coming here, you think everybody's your friend, and everyone is. But for that new person, it's so important for us to, like, get out of our clumps, <laughs> get out of our circles, and, and go, you know what? I'll, I'll talk to you all week long, but I see someone I haven't seen before, and I'm going to go talk to them. I'm going to have a smile on my face. I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to bless them. That's what joining the dream team is all about, is, is learning to live that way. Growth track is happening after second service today. If you've been in the bleachers for a little while, if you've been up in the stands, and as long as you need that, we're here for you. As long as you need to just come and receive for a little while, hey, blessings on you. But if you're ready, if you feel God beginning to tug on your heart, you know what? I'm ready to take my faith and my expression here at my church to the next level. I'm ready to get out of the stands and onto the field and join the dream team. I would encourage you. And you're, you're going to really enjoy it. It's going to be a blessing to you to change your paradigm and change your thinking around this. Okay. Um, as a kid, you know, being like Jesus, I was thinking about this. Uh, as a kid, I remember um, watching my dad um, just live his life and just watching him and wanting to be like him. I kind of reminisce. I can kind of remember what it feel, felt like to, to be that way. In fact, one day my dad came out of the bedroom all dressed. He had a red shirt on. My dad's just plain Jane guy, just a, a plain red shirt, some blue jeans and his sneakers. And I'm like, he, he, he. go back into my room, <laughs> go back into my room, found the reddest shirt I could. You know where I'm going with this. Found the bluest jeans I could. And I came out, popped out of the, out of the room. My dad's like, what? What, what are you doing? And I'm like, look, I'm you. I know dads like that. I know they like it because my son, Evan, um, he, for my last birthday or Father's Day, it was about a year ago, his present to me, which his mom bought, I'm sure. <laughs> He's six. He doesn't have a job. Um, he got me a shirt with a truck on it. A shirt with a truck on it. Because he had a shirt with a truck on it. And his master plan was... We can wear the same shirt, bro. We can wear the same shirts. And I, it feels good, man. It feels good. He doesn't want to just do what I say. He wants to be like me. Like I do my hair up, you know, I got my, I got my hair gel and I'm doing my thing, you know. And then he goes into the bathroom and gets his hair like soaking wet and has one of those little combs and like combs the front and the back is still like heck of crazy but he comes to front and he's like walks up doesn't say anything <laughs> like yeah bro I see you I see you look good man you look good I think it honors I think it honors God to not just do what he says but to be like him to chase after his heart to want to be like him let's round this thing off the last thing about walking with Jesus is is committing to him committing to him because you know walking with God walking with Jesus doing everything we're talking about this is this is a real serious matter and it takes commitment it takes real commitment committing to Christ used to be deadly and what I want to share with you is that it still is it still is deadly you could still lose everything in fact that's the only way to follow him is to lose everything is to truly sacrifice it all 
I want to read it to you out of Galatians 2. My old self, crucified. My old self, dead, gone. I died. I died to me. I died to my style. I died to my ways. I died to my preferences. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I live by this earth, in this earthly body, trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When we commit to Christ, everybody, we're marked by him. We're marked by him. This should be visible, not a secret. We should be, there should be some boldness to it. Not arrogance. We talked about humility already. We know how important humility is. But there should be something very visible about our walk with Christ. Like a scar with a story. Speaking of which, I have a scar. Maybe you've seen it already. It's right there. This scar has a story. When I lost this finger, uh, many of you know, it was because of sharks. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> ninjas. It was actually ninjas. I was attacked by ninjas. No, <laughs> no I'm going to save the real story for later. But when I lost it, it was, a, it was during the time that I was getting sober and getting saved. And so often, I'll, I'll look at my hand and just be grateful. I'll look at my deformed hands, you know, my missing finger, and just be grateful because I know, like, right when I was getting sober, right when I was getting saved, right when everything was changing, and it's like a mark that reminds me. It takes me back to the beginning. Walking with Christ, there should be something visible about us. I'm not saying you have to lop off a finger. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> Please don't do that. Pastor Elliot said I need to chop my finger off. No, 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 no. It's an expression. Is that there should be something visible about us, something that shows others and shows ourselves, this is who I am now. This is who I am now. I'm in covenant with the one true God, and this is for life. This scar is never going away. This mark is never going away. I am marked for life by Christ, the Son of God, who takes away the sin of the world. What I want to do today is, is pray for you that if you've never made that decision, if you've never made that commitment before, today's a perfect day. Today's a perfect day to do it. So I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I want to encourage you, open your heart and mind to him. Open your heart and mind to him. Father, I just lift up every single one of these people here today. And I want to especially pray for anybody who feels like they're far from you. Anyone who feels like they may be undeserving. Anyone who feels like they might need a little bit more forgiveness than the person next to them. Lord, specifically for them. Anybody going through a, a trouble or a trial or a hang up, anything. Lord, I want you to show up in their lives right here and right now. Even as I'm speaking, would you just fill them up? Would you fill their heart with your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness? And Lord, in response, we, we commit to you. We commit to you. This is not a fad. This is not a feeling. This is a commitment. This is our life. So if you're here today and that's you, if you're here online and that's you, we just invite you to just lift up your hand and say, that's me. I want to make Jesus king in my life. Amen. I see you. Hallelujah. I see you too. And you and you. Hallelujah. Come on. It's your time. I see you. Amen. I see you too. Hallelujah. This is your moment. This is your time. Let's make a commitment to him. Church, let's pray together as a family. No one praying alone today. Let's pray out loud. Say, Father God, I give my heart to you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sin. Forgive me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.